Hello everyone, my name is Kyle Matthews. I'm executive director of the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies. We're very pleased today to welcome you to Right City 2021. Uh, this year, uh, the focus of this conference is on human rights in the digital age. Um, for those of you who don't know, in 2017, um, uh, MIGS, uh, my institute, and the Raul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights uh, decided to, uh, in order to mark Montreal's 375th anniversary and Canada's 150th anniversary, to launch Right City, to create Canada's leading human rights forum and dialogue. And since then, this is now the fourth annual event. Last year, unfortunately, was canceled. We had to postpone it because of COVID. Um, but we're really happy that we were able to get all some amazing partners and speakers together uh, to make this um, Right City conference take place. Um, I would like to first thank all the different partners who contributed this year uh, to this event. First, we thank the Raul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. Uh, the Department of National Defense's Targeted Engagement Program, uh, the Human Rights Research and Education Center at the University of Ottawa, led by John Packer, the Embassy of the Netherlands to Canada, Global Action Against Mass Frosty Crimes Network, the U.S. Embassy to Canada, and this is also being held under the patronage of the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. Um, for those uh, who are following the news, um, you won't you'll realize that digital technologies are having a major impact on human rights across the globe. And we've brought together a key group of the leading experts that are working at the intersection of emerging technologies and human rights. Uh, we are gonna have sessions about the threat that the internet poses to democracy. We're gonna be looking at digital authoritarianism. We'll be exploring uh, how to confront online hate speech. We'll be looking at online disinformation and how that impacts democracies. And we'll also be looking at some other really new areas about the, the ideas behind having a, a digital Geneva Convention. So uh, if you look at the program, we're gonna be having uh, approximately two hours of discussions starting today until next Friday over four days. Uh, please share the links with your, with your friends, with your colleagues working on human rights. We will of course post these videos online after. So if you want to share them, you're welcome to. And you can also join the discussion on Twitter, um, where we are, uh, where you can use the hashtag Right City to share some of the comments, the thoughts, or discussions being held. So, with that uh, being said, I would like to now uh, pass the floor to our first uh, speaker to make introductory remarks before panel one starts. I would like to share, um, ask our uh, colleague Erwin Kotler, who's the founder and chair of the Raul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights and Canada's former. Uh, Minister of Justice, as well as a special envoy on anti-Semitism to take the floor and address uh, everyone in the crowd. Thank, thank you, Kyle, for kind words of introduction. I'm delighted to participate in this important gathering, which is as timely as it is significant. And may I express uh, our appreciation uh, to our governmental, non-governmental, uh, academic uh, partners for their engagement. As it happens, we meet not only on the occasion still of COVID-19, but on the occasion of a global uh, political pandemic characterized by a resurgent global authoritarianism, including a digital authoritarianism, the backsliding of democracies, assaults on human rights, and the dystopian use and abuse of cyber technology to threaten both our democratic values and our human rights. In a word, what is happening now is that while technology races, the scientists are once again beating the lawyers. Technology races and the law lags. Accordingly, may I summarize almost in a series of one-liners the dystopian features of our cyber technology revolution, which now include one, the proliferation of state-sponsored cyber warfare, where bugs like Stuxnet almost seem like part of the past and have been overtaken by more sophisticated cyber warfare that can disrupt electoral grids, shut down airports, derail election infrastructures, and where at this point the fingers on the keyboard or the bots on the screen are more important than the boots on the ground. And while we have developed international legal regimes for the laws of wars, we have yet to develop a legal regime in the matter of cyber warfare. And here too, the scientists are beating the lawyers with adverse and dangerous consequences. Second is the weaponization of cyber technology, where, for example, the US Department of Justice recently unsealed charges accusing Russian intelligence of a whole series of aggressive cyber attacks, like targeting the 2017 French election, 
targeting the uh, power grids in the Ukraine that caused major damage, targeting uh, major corporations like Pfizer and the like, which caused billion dollars of damage. The whole presaging perspective damage and disruption that we have yet to encounter. The third is the proliferation of ransomware attacks, uh, the malicious software that locks up a target a computer until uh, the, the victim pays off the attacker. And we have witnessed not only ransom attacks targeting election infrastructures, but also attacks targeting universal health uh, operations, which in times of the COVID are as dangerous as they are terrifying. Fourth is the weaponization of social media by global authoritarians to repress and not only silence dissidents at home, but engage in disinformation and destabilization abroad. Fifth is the exponential, I would call it explosive increase in hate and incitement on the internet and the social media, where online hate leads to offline hate crimes. And we've seen a proliferation of both. Where the uh, belated but welcome final uh, announcement of the prohibition Holocaust denial has ignored the sanitization of Holocaust distortion, where in the recent International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance uh, conference that concluded last week, reference was made to the explosion of Holocaust uh, distortion, and also to state-sanctioned incitement to hate and, and genocide, uh, where the platforms, governments are ignoring that the responsibility to prevent and protect here is not only a policy option, but it is, in a word, an international legal obligation. Finally, in the relationship between national security, technology, and human rights of threats to democracy and threats uh, to uh, law enforcement, what we have found is that uh, law enforcement agencies have <coughs> purchased technology from private companies, which has resulted in a whole series of violations of both democratic space and civil liberties, uh, not time to go into it, but what we need here uh, is really uh, to reframe the relationship between investors, private companies, law enforcement agencies, democratic space and human rights. In conclusion, the cyber tech revolution, while having important advances, and we know these advances in medicine, in science, in the economy, in communications and the like, as we have all appreciated, at the same time, poses serious challenges for our shared humanity, the threats of cyberware, ransomware, threats regarding the abuse of artificial intelligence, the weaponization of social media and the like. In a word, either we control the algorithms or the algorithms will control us. Control us. Either we develop integrated policies for smart uh, regulation that will allow te technological development to continue and all of us to be the beneficiaries of that technological uh, development, or we will have a situation that if technology races and the law continues to lag, the result will be a standing threat to our shared uh, humanity, our democratic space, and our human rights. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Erwin. Everyone, that was the Honorable Erwin Kotler, uh, Chair and Founder of the Royal Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. Uh, who covered pretty much all the topics we're going to discuss in detail over the next four days. So thank you, Erwin, for uh, joining us and sharing your important uh, comments um, and thoughts on the issue of human rights in the digital age. I would now like to invite uh, Jason Munyan. Uh, Jason is representative of the UN Secretary General's um, Office of the Tech Envoy. Shows you how important that digital technologies are having on discussion when the UN is now creating new offices to deal with something that just didn't exist 10, 15 years ago. So with that being said, I'd like to ask Jason, please, if you could take the floor. Thank you very much. Um, Executive Director Kyle Matthews, Chair Erwin Kotler, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Office of the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy in Technology, it is a real pleasure to speak at the opening of this third annual Right City Conference on Human Rights in the Digital Age. I would like to thank the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies for hosting this event and uh, the Raoul uh, Wallenberg Center for Human Rights and the various other partners who have helped organize it. We've really put together a great program with excellent panelists and moderators. 
The topics we will discuss for the next several days, from foreign interference, disinformation, and confronting hate speech, to digital authoritarianism, attacks on activists, and investigating atrocity crimes, and more, are so critical and, unfortunately, timely. Last Friday, June 11th, marks the first anniversary of the issuance of the Secretary General's Roadmap for Digital Cooperation, which calls on us to connect, respect, and protect all people in the digital age. Digital human rights is a key focus of the roadmap, which emphasizes the Secretary General's concern over aspects such as data protection and privacy, surveillance technologies, and online harassment and violence. This past year, internet access has been a lifeline for many people, enabling access to information about COVID-19, healthcare and vaccines, and providing a means for some to work, study, and socialize online. But those who have been fortunate to have access to the internet are also vulnerable to the real possibility of human rights violations online and a growing threat of internet shutdowns or having platforms suddenly blocked. Erwin Kotler has just described some of these challenges. Last week, there was a RightsCon summit on, on human rights in the digital age. Leading up to the summit, nine United Nations Special Rapporteurs released a joint statement underscoring the need to prioritize digital rights to rebuilding civic space in the COVID-19 recovery. They said, Quote, despite the instrumental role of the internet and digital technologies, which have provided new avenues for the exercise of public freedoms and access to health and related information and care, in particular during the COVID-19 pandemic, states continue to leverage these technologies to muzzle dissent, surveil, and quash online and offline collective action, and the tech companies have done too little to avert such abuse of human rights, unquote. The Human Rights Council has repeatedly affirmed that the same rights that people have offline must also be respect protected online. But we are seeing people online being forced offline and their rights violated. According to Access Now and the Keep It On Coalition, in the first five months of this year, there were at least 50 internet shutdowns in 21 countries, including the longest internet shutdowns on record. Access now notes that these internet shutdowns have become more sophisticated, lasting longer, affecting more people, and targeting vulnerable groups. This, despite the fact that, as noted in the Roadmap for Digital Cooperation, blanket internet shutdowns and generic blocking and filtering of services are considered by United Nations human rights mechanisms to be in violation of international human rights law. Facing these challenges, the roadmap sets forth three main recommendations to strengthen protection of digital human rights. First, within the United Nations, it calls for the development of system-wide guidance on human rights due diligence and impact assessments in the use of new technologies. This is already underway, led by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Second, the Secretary General calls on member states to place human rights at the center of regulatory frameworks and legislation on, on the development and use of digital technologies. But efforts by the United Nations and member states are not enough. The third recommendation is for technology leaders to acknowledge the importance of protecting the right to privacy and other human rights in the digital space and to take clear company-specific actions to do so. We are already working on implementing these recommendations, both within and outside the United Nations system. At United Nations headquarters and in the field, with with resident coordinators, country teams, and partners. As the Secretary General repeatedly emphasized, the United Nations stands ready to serve as a platform where these discussions can take place with the widest possible range of actors. Whether you, whether you are from a United Nations agency, a member state, a tech company, a civil society organization, or the academic or technical communities, the Office of the Envoy and Technology is here to facilitate cooperation, and we welcome ideas and partnerships. We look forward to a lively and productive Right City Conference this week and hope to hear your suggestions on how best to protect human rights in, in this digital age. Following this conference, consideration of this topic will continue at the upcoming session of the Human Rights Council and later this year at the Internet Governance Forum. As Assistant Jet Secretary General Spatulizano said this morning in another setting, together we can make sure that the technological advances of tomorrow do not come at the expense of the fundamental universal human rights we pledge to uphold, defend, and promote. Thank you.
Thank you, Jason, for the overview of the important work uh, that the UN is doing at the multilateral level. And we look forward to following your work and, and possibly having more collaboration uh, between Canadian groups and the UN Office for the Tech Envoy. Um, I would now like to invite all uh, members of the first panel, Can Democracy Survive the Internet, to join us. OK, it seems like almost everyone is here. Fantastic. I'm going to hand over to Rafal Rosinski, who is a founder and principal of the SecDev group in Canada. Rafal, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much. And hopefully technology will not fail us and everybody can uh, can hear. Um, really, really pleased to be invited this year to moderate uh, this kickoff panel, uh, probably one of the more important panels that we're going to have this, uh, this, this, uh, this session. So the internet is just over 50 years old this year. In a blink of a historical eye, more than two thirds of humanity is now connected to a universe of information, economic opportunity and political intrigue. The internet is today's generic infrastructure for globalization. By some estimates, by 2025, the value of the new digital economy will be 25% of global GDP. That's 25% of all goods and services traded everywhere on the planet will have a direct digital link. The internet has also grown unevenly. The commanding heights, to use an old economic concept, are dominated by hyperscale platforms and providers. These titans of technology provide the silicone, steel, and energy required to run massive data centers and, in of themselves, have become repositories of oceans of data that are the new black gold of the digital era. But economic concentration and the quantification of everything into monetizable data is only part of the story. The internet is also young in other ways. Two thirds of those connected to the internet are under the age of 35 and 50% are under the age of 25. These are young adults just entering into their most productive years. This is the demographic that is inclined to want change in the world and challenge the status quo. For the most part, the new internet cohort are not coming from advanced industrialized economies, but rather from emerging and transitioning economies where the rapid shift online has led to social and political pressures as traditional gatekeepers, family, schools, institutions have been circumvented by direct access to the 24 by seven stream of entertainment, conversation and engagement from the likes of Facebook, TikTok, and the increasingly interactive gaming environment. These technologies are transforming the relationship between individuals and institutions. And like earlier communications revolutions, such as the Gutenberg press, they've unleashed creativity and sparked social tensions by upending the status quo and comfortable institutional relationships. And like earlier communications revolutions, this present revolution is likely to redefine our institutions and the processes on which they depend. Gutenberg may have sought to render the word of God into the vernacular, but the second most popular book printed on his presses after the Bible was Malem Maleficarum, the Book of Witches, his era's version of disinformation that led to the persecution of women as witches, non-believers as heretics, and unleashed the nationalist wars of that century. So what will the digital age bring to our present concept of democracy? The online world presents new challenges to our practice of democracy. While democracy should be an exercise in free voice and will, over time, rules such as those limiting spending on advertising, direct influence, as well as the important role of independent media and other gatekeepers to act as fact checkers has represented a shifting but largely centered process that has served the interests of most, if not all. The internet has upended this apple cart. On one hand, offering more direct form of democracy and voice, and on the other hand, threatening ochlocracy, or the rule of the mob that endangers the democratic process and its outcome. Add to this the absence of accepted set of international norms governing behavior between states and cyberspace, and the lack of effective governance over social media platforms has resulted in a means for anyone on the planet to shape discourse and opinions and influence local democratic choice. Will democracy survive the internet? How will it change? Over the next 60 minutes, we'll delve into the depths of these associated questions. And joining us today is a stellar panel. They are Emily Dreyfus, a journalist and fellow at the Harvard Shorstein Center for Media, Politics and Public Policy. Emily is the editor of the Media Manipulation Casebook, which aims to explain how the cycles of media manipulation works and the 
co-lead of the Harvard Shorstein News Leaders Program, a former reporter and editor for Wired Magazine and 2018 Neiman Fellow. Her area of focus is how technology affects society. Also joining us is Sophie Zhang, a data scientist at Facebook for just under three years who worked in her spare time to uproot state-sponsored troll farms run by Azerbaijan and Honduras. She's become a whistleblower after failing to fix the company from within. Also joining us is Alice Stolmeyer, who is the founder and executive director of Defend Democracy, a nonpartisan transatlantic foundation working to defend democracy. With a decline of digital strategic communications, a decade story of digital <laughs> strategic communication under her belt, she initiated a social media watchdog for the Netherlands elections and developed Twitter 101 with do's and don'ts for dealing with online disinformation and propaganda. As a former PhD student in the social sciences, a social study of science, technology, and society, her foundation focuses on foreign, domestic, and technological threats to democracy. The format for today's panel will be straightforward. We'll go through a round of three questions ranging from the essential, is democracy in crisis, through to what we actually know about disinformation and its impact. We'll end by looking forward on how democracy can be made or perhaps remade in the digital era. We'll also take some questions from the audience, so please put them in the chat function and we'll add them into the mix. Panelists, welcome. So let's get started. So Emily, I'd like to turn to you first. Is democracy actually in crisis or is this a crisis of the moment? Digital technologies are reshaping the relationship between individuals and institutions uh, enabled by these hyperscale social media platforms. But are we seeing the short-term growing pains of a new revitalized democracy? Or is the absence of effective platform governance really leading us down to a fundamentally undemocratic future? Emily, over to you. Thank you so much, Rafal. Um, you know, I do not want to be a pessimist, but we are certainly in a very serious moment for democracy and things, if we leave, the situation as it is, it will not just work itself out. Um, democracy is something that has to be tended and um, taken care of. And what we're what we're seeing right now is that, as you all know, and as your work has shown, you know, the internet has accelerated and changed the way that bad actors can come together to coordinate to um, undermine democracy, but it's not just disinformation and coordinated manipulation campaigns. It also allows people who would otherwise have had toxic beliefs or undemocratic beliefs or who believe that politics should not be democratic to have a much wider outlet and to use the fundamental infrastructure of the Internet to connect and push that agenda. Um, you know, we're talking about what are human rights in this era and one of the rights and fundamental pillars of democracy and the only way that it can work is if people who are citizens of democracies have access to true accurate local timely information we can't participate in democracy if we don't know the truth of what's happening in our world that's one of the basic parts of it right um, and what we're seeing with the way that the internet right now has is is uh, formatted and the ways in which we don't have safeguards and rails to protect against abusive behavior is that the internet right now is actually incentivizing a lack of accurate information. It's creating, I don't know if I would call it a crisis of democracy, but it's creating an information crisis for sure, where if someone is interested to find a fact or to learn what is going on with, let's say, a specific policy or a specific election in their nation, in Azerbaijan, in Canada, in the US, uh, going to the internet is where we go to find find those answers. But the way the internet is is set up right now, when you go to ask a question, what you can encounter is inauthentic people who are who are um, you know pretending to be real uh, influential and trustworthy sources, as Sophie's work at Facebook unearthed, um, or they will find you know little kind of snippets of information that are left on the internet by bad actors as an entrance to the rabbit hole to deceive them. So we've got we've got social media is a is a problem. We have the the very structure of search on the internet is hugely problematic. It incentivizes things that are most recent. 
um, and most popular rather than most true. All of the systems on the internet that we have right now to provide information to people in order to in enable them to make informed decisions about democracy are under attack, not necessarily, and, and this is the scariest part, it, it's not necessarily people using these systems incorrectly. They're using these systems the way they were designed to be used. And, and that's where technologists have to think ahead. They have to realize the ways in which they've created technologies that can and will be abused and that there will never be. It is impossible, as you said, with, with, with the printing press. There has never been a form of communication that doesn't include misinformation. You can't communicate in a world without misinformation. People will get things wrong. People will intentionally see things that are incorrect. And we have to realize that and then create a system that accounts for it. And right now we are playing catch up. Mm. Well, thank you. I, I, I like this, particularly this image of, of, of the social media companies. So there's a Frankenstein that, that we've uh, let, uh, let loose and, uh, and now try to, to understand whether or not it's its basic nature to behave that it does. But before we get to that, Alice, I, I wanted to turn to you here uh, because I know that some of the work that you've done uh, particularly in terms of acting as a watchdog for elections and, and also some of the do's and don'ts for uh, online disinformation, um, presumably, you know, allow you to get a pretty good purchase on the question of whether or not this is really a crisis of the moment. In other words, a crisis when we have a mass population that's principally young, that has gone online, delving into a new environment where, where the, that range of experimentation is causing this distortion of democracy, or, or are we really looking at something which is much more fundamental, something more long-term? And I'm reminded here that you know our practice of democracy has changed over the decades. Let's not forget that the enfranchisement of women, even in this country, uh, didn't happen all that long ago. And prior to that time, there was a different institutional order. So, so these things do change over time. So what's your view, crisis of the moment or crisis of democracy? Well, for me, the question, can democracy survive the internet is like asking, can climate survive fossil fuels? Hmm. Um, having worked uh, in the past as a digital climate campaigner, I see many similarities between the big tech lobby and the fossil fuel lobby. Now, the latter has been denying science and delaying and obstructing regulation for over 50 years. And looking at the speed of new technologies shaping our societies and affecting our democracies, I don't think we have 50 years. I sometimes wonder we may not even have five years. So if we want democracy to survive, we really need urgent democratic oversight and more transparency and accountability of big tech. Hmm. So, so that's an interesting question because I think it brings us back to this uh, Frankenstein question. And, and Sophie, maybe I'd like to turn to you next, uh, given the fact that you, in some respects, lived within the body of Frankenstein for at least three years. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, it is fundamentally the architecture of, of these hyperscale social media platforms such that their ability to be regulated in the way that Alice was, was suggesting needs to happen for democracy to survive a reality? Or, or is that just fundamentally against the business model so much that, that these corporations either wouldn't survive or, or, or we won't survive in their present state? Thank you very much, Rafal. And and so my answer is that in some ways, many of the social media companies counterintuitively counterintuitive, have actually asked to be regulated. For instance, Facebook has asked for more digital regulation. And I think part of the issue, reason for that is that first, the companies don't want to be arbiter, arbiters of the public discourse. And secondly, that it would frankly enshrine the monopoly by as new new startups would have much more difficulty complying with regulation but that, that shouldn't be taken as an optimistic sign that everything is perfect because for instance when australia tri tried to seek out and regulate social media companies itself it instead found itself hit with a hit with a new span australia had had sought to incentivize social media companies require them to pay new to pay news 
companies for, for publishing the articles. And instead, it was it was the one who was forced to compromise its goals. And many silicon many companies and now now into act with tech diplomats sent by other countries. These are d- diplomats who essentially, instead of being sent to to a foreign country, they are sent to Silicon Valley to speak with tech world. And I think this highlights the sheer power and and influence of social media companies. Like, like the fact that I myself, as frankly a very junior employee at Facebook, was able to convince the company to oppose the governments of Honduras and Azerbaijan, it's also a sign of that. And and so and so and so I think the, and and so I think ultimately the world does need t- technology to be regulated more, but at the same time that regulation currently is happening to a large extent and coordinated by countries. For instance, the European Union is conducting regulation the, that is in some ways disagreeing with the United States. And I think it would be productive and helpful for those nations to come together and work on a collective solution because the genie is already out of the bottle and the and the road is more connected than ever. And we can't have essentially two, two roads on opposite sides of the Atlantic. Thank you, Sophie. That that's really interesting. And and Emily, I'm going to come back to you on something uh, here because I think this is a really interesting question about uh, social media companies. And I think you know Facebook has been held up uh, because it's been most vocal about this, calling for regulation. Um, the cynical view would be, uh, as Sophie said, that this is a interesting way of actually keeping out any competition because the costs of regulation would be a barrier for entry to anyone to compete with Facebook. Uh, but I think there's also some more troubling features here that are worthwhile looking at. For example, one way of being able to combat disinformation uh, would be to require positive identification. In other words, if you're a social media user, there has to be something that identifies you as a real physical being living in a particular jurisdiction. While they, that may seem in of itself rather innocuous, um, it also becomes a way of being able to take away the very important privacy and anonymity um, that uh, is an important feature of democracy, both at its ballot uh, stage, but also in terms of the exercise of, of, of free voice. So how does exactly manipulation of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of, of media and this accountability for content fit within the cloud of regulation that, that, that seemingly is going to help solve this problem in the future? There is not an easy answer, right? Um, if there was, we would have draft policy legislation um, that everyone who was there are so many smart people thinking about this problem. And if everyone had an agreed solution, we'd all be pushing that that regulation. Um, the truth is absolutely, you know, you cannot, you cannot have the internet and all of the good things that it provides if you uh, eliminate anonymity. However, I also would posit that even if you attempted to put in place a real name uh, requirement, or if you were gonna do, you know, there are some, platforms like in the US, there's a platform called Nextdoor, for instance, that um, you can only join if you live in the neighborhood. And it actually verifies that by sending you a letter in the mail. So there's there's blueprints for this kind of verification, but mm, all of those systems can be gamed. There are definitely people who ma- manage to get onto Nextdoor who do not live in that neighborhood. Um, and I, I think that that would happen if that was part of the regulation. Reg- any regulation, and I agree with Sophie, you know, completely. It, it has to be uh, cohesive, and they, it can't be not in agreement. Also, especially since so many of our um, of our tech systems are created in the U.S., the fact of the matter is that whatever the U.S. regulation is will end up being de facto um, what the baseline is, and then the larger the the um, the country where they can actually make more money than they may, uh, these companies may follow those rules. But the truth is, so whatever the regulation is, they need to match, they need to not be so disparate, but what they have to do is take into account the fact that no matter what, the systems will be gamed. Whatever rule you put in place to say it has to be accurate, these have to be real people, it has to be pre-fact checked. I mean, even if you put in a thing that said, you can't publish a statement on Facebook until someone has checked and said it is it passes muster. Even if that were the regulation, um, it, you know someone would get around it. 
they always find a way to get around it. That this is where, you know, if you create a system that is fact checking for keywords or hashtags that are pushing a media manipulation campaign, well then the um, campaign operators will put the hashtag in an image because the systems can't tell it from an image. There's always a way around it. So, but, but Emily, but Emily, let me just take you to task on that a little bit. I mean, you know, we, we, if we take a look at how most laws work, let's take, for example, simply bylaws within a city that you can or cannot park on a corner or you should stop at a stoplight. Um, you know, there, there isn't a sort of automatic consequence and these, these can be gamed as well. If there's nobody around, I can run a red light. But the reason that we follow them is because we've created norms around it, norms of behavior that are, that are backed up by laws. And, and the reality well, yeah. is that, that they can be broken in game, but most people will follow them. Is, isn't that a desirable state that we want to get online as well? Sure, but it's not just norms, it's also enforcement. And that's the mm. really most difficult question of any any kinds of rules you know all of us can get together and say we agree that there shouldn't be you know you shouldn't you, you should have to pay for parking or you should not be able to post child pornography or um, intentional harassment or inauthentic comments in a democratic election year okay um we can all agree on that and i think that it's very important that we do come to a consensus about what is acceptable but without understanding what the enforcement of those rules will be, the fact is we actually already have some rules like that, right? We already have terms of services, but the internet, we don't have a good way to enforce it. Um, one of the things that we, you know, Alice mentioned transparency and transparency, the, this is something that we could regulate. You know, we need, we need to know what do the social media companies know? Like take for instance, the US um, in January, on January 6th, there was the insurrection in the US. So many of these, th this was a purely anti-democratic protest act of violence um, that was planned on the internet, that was fomented on the internet. The factions of people who descended, you know, met each other on the internet, their ideas were innovated on the internet. And then the entire event was live streamed, live blog, tweeted and captured on the internet as was the planning. But much of that has been deleted now. Men much of it was deleted because it broke the terms of service and was against the norms and rules of these systems who maybe didn't catch them beforehand, but deleted them afterwards. But, but now uh, as these people have been arrested and the US is attempting you know, feebly to go through and figure out what happened and hold people to account, the information is gone. And we don't mm. even have a regulation in place in the US to say to Facebook, to say to Twitter, to say to Zello and all these other m small apps, hey, anything you deleted, you need to give it to us or you need to have kept it because it's evidence. Mm. Um, so there's so many kinds of things like that, that before we can, it's just, it can't be just don't lie on the internet. There's a lot mm. of, of background rules we need to think about. Yeah. So the accountability is really interesting. And I, I guess, Alice, I'd like to turn to you, uh, seeing that you do come from a European perspective where, among other things, um, concept of, of, of privacy and expectations of privacy are, are very different than they are in the United States, for example, and certainly very different than they are in countries like Azerbaijan and Honduras, which we'll talk about next. Um, this issue of, of regulation that's backed up by enforcement, um, and in particular, this idea of positive ID that in order to be on on, on the internet, you have to have a, a verifiable identification. Um, how do you see that from the perspective of, uh, of, of creating accountability for actions on the internet? Does it strengthen democracy or does it particular, potentially create other kinds of pitfalls that uh, we need to watch for? Well, I think the the idea of uh, IDing people before they can use uh, a social media account or something is, you know, might seem attractive uh, for some obvious reasons, like um, you know um, there might be perhaps less bots and per perhaps people might be uh, more polite online to each other um but it's quite um a different situation in uh more author authoritarian countries um so there are definitely pitfalls and i would uh an observation that i had is that even in a democracy like the united states 
during the previous administration, many, many people had anonymous uh, accounts. So even in the United States, people felt that it might not necessarily be safe to reveal your true identity. Um, so that's on the positive ID, uh, ID um, concept. Um, on regulation, transparency, accountability, etc. in the European Union uh, as compared to in the United States. Um, well, there's a lot of things that might play uh, that might play a role in why we have more um, advanced or more stricter regulation. Uh, one is probably the difference in um, how we see freedom of expression in the United States that seems like almost uh, unlimited. In the European Union, that's less the case. There really is, um, um, you know, my freedom ends where yours begins. So there, there is more, more um, stricter limits to people's freedom. Um, what I think also plays a role is that precisely the, the big tech companies, many of them are American. And so there may be more uh, economic interests um, to be a little lenient, to um, have more of a a conversation with them rather than regulation um, and perhaps another uh, aspect that might play a role is that uh, in the United States the focus um, I feel is often um, much on uh, uh, more on the, the security aspect of technologies and less on the, let's say, the human rights aspect. And mm. I would strongly recommend that to to look at both at the mm. at the same time, even though that might be difficult. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, well, we'll return to this question of, of of making and remaking democracy, and perhaps making and remaking uh, the hyperscale. Um, uh, social media companies that have been so disruptive in this sort of third chapter of our discussion. But but for the moment, I, I'd like to shine a little bit of a light on this question of disinformation and foreign interference. Um, there's a famous cartoon from, from the 1920s, a character called Pogo in the US. And uh, one of his famous taglines is, we have met the enemy and he is us. Um, so I think what I'd like us to, to turn to right now is to discuss a little bit, what do we know about disinformation in particular or foreign interference? The 2016 elections in the US and the subsequent Brexit vote in the UK have been held up as examples of foreign interference and disinformation designed to undermine democracy. And yet, the role of foreign interference in shaping voter behavior appears to be a magnitude lower than the organically generated political advertising supercharged through paid algorithmic means. So is foreign interference the principal threat or is the issue the business model inherent to social media platforms? And, and Sophia, I'd, I'd like you to perhaps take a stab at this first. Uh, because perhaps, you know, from your perspective inside the belly of the beast, you're your best place to give us some insight. Sophie? Sorry. Thank you very much for, for asking. So first, I'd like to unpack this question a bit, since we've talked about disinformation and foreign interference. And so when people refer to disinformation, I, I frankly hadn't encountered this term very much until I left Facebook. And so it's and so people think and this information on the face of it is misinformation that is being intentionally spread. So there's also misinformation that people spread because they truly believe it, because they believe that vaccines will make your skin magnetic, because they saw a YouTube video or something like that. And there's and and at Facebook, this is also the term disinformation is also used to apply to what they call coordinated inauthentic behavior of, of, of inauthentic accounts, essentially, that are being used to spread specific messages, regardless of whether the messages are true or false. And so, and, and so, and so, these are three separate elements that, that I'm trying to untangle. The first, the first is inauthentic act accounts and their use. 
this, this is a function of who the person is. It's not a function of who, what they're saying. If I use fake accounts to say that cats are adorable, this is still inauthentic activity. The second is misinformation, which is which is saying things that aren't true. And this is a function of what you're saying and not who the person is. If I say the moon is made out of cheese, that's misinformation regardless of who, of who I am. And the third is the foreign component, whether the, whether the activity is foreign or domestic. And so now that I've unpacked it, at Facebook, I worked on inauthentic in activity primarily, and I realized that people are quite concerned about foreign interference, especially foreign disinformation. But I'm going to say something that I'm guessing will be a bit controversial. I think people in the Western world are too concerned about foreign interference and foreign disinformation. And what I mean by that is not that it does not exist, but rather that the amount of suspected foreign activity on Facebook is it vastly outnumbers the actual amounts. And at Facebook, I worked on two, two high priority cases in which there was suspected foreign inauthentic activity, foreign disinformation in Western countries. And in both of these cases, the activity was not foreign. It was in fact actual domestic citizens of those countries who for some reason felt the need to pretend to be a foreign disinformation mm -hmm. campaign, mm -hmm. which would be funny if it weren't so sad. And so I real and so the intentions of people who work on who are concerned about foreign disinformation are, and foreign interference are quite positive, but uh, but but perversely they're playing into Russian hands, I believe, because 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 it serves Russia's interests to to exaggerate the ubiquity and power of their influence. It, uh, it, uh, of creating the perception that electoral results are perverted and, and trustworthy because they have been influenced by themselves. And to that extent, any few of them serves, serves their needs. And, 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 and so th that's the dynamic I wanted, I, I wanted to discuss. And that's what I'm discussing. In, and that's the issue, I think, a lot of the issue in Western countries, because because of, like we know now from leaked documents after my time at Facebook, that Facebook was reluctant to act, to act against the against stop the steel organizers who were coordinating the violent attack on the United States Capitol, and uh, because they weren't sure if because they believed that these were people who were authentically and genuinely concerned about the election. But but authenticity is only when it, it's authenticity is only when the policy is only when a uh, factor. Like no one would suggest that a bank robber is somehow legal just because he didn't wear a mask and didn't steal someone else's identity. <laughs> like Facebook, like Facebook maintains the terms of services with twenty six entries, and authenticity is only two of them. Like Facebook also has to, one of them is against coordinating harmful or criminal activity, and and despite this, Facebook failed to enforce this before the election because it was frankly too focused on authenticity issues and for and foreign interference. It was refighting the last war. And so th that's the state of the matter in Western countries. And I do want to differentiate because in many more authoritarian countries, I have personally seen national governments who, 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 are, who are essentially misleading their own citizenry on vast scales. Because, because of course, the dictators of yesteryear were able to bust in crowds to their rallies. But, the, but, but, uh, but, the, but when you have a crowd, every person in that crowd has to be a real person. And mm -hmm. and 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 of course, on the internet, anyone can pretend to be as many people as they want. The Romanian Revolution happened. Ceausescu fell after a crowd of Bastin supporters turned upon him. I don't think Ilham Aliyev's paid trolls will ever turn on him, just because it's much easier to control a far smaller number of, of people, and it's far and to motivate them appropriately with with salaries and etc. If you're a paid troll, your job will, will be lost if there's a revolution after all. Mm. Well, thanks, Sophie. And Alice, you know, I'd, I'd like to turn to you next because uh, invariably, although Europe is close, if you like, as, as part of the G7 to the, to the core of where these hyperscale companies operate, um, invariably, uh, there are important cultural differences. And in Europe in particular, we've seen the rise of right-wing movements um, that have been the result of a variety of different functions. So this issue of, of, of one hand, 
disinformation and misinformation that has started to become the current and the currency of, of, of local politics, but also then the, the difficulty sometimes faced by national authorities in being able to bring their cases to hyperscale companies, you know, for even localized regulation has, has certainly become a lot uh, harder. So how do you view the, the issue of, of misinformation, disinformation and foreign interference, you know, from a European perspective? Well, with our uh, the social media watchdog that we had uh, uh, active during the Netherlands elections, which took place in March of this year, uh, we definitely ran into both uh, foreign and domestic uh, coordinated disinformation and manipulation uh, campaigns. Um, the difference, I think, uh, or some of the differences are that, uh, you know, when you're in a tiny country in Europe, you have, you know, before we started, we didn't have any contact points at Facebook or, or Twitter or, or any of the, of the platforms. Uh, this only started to be established once we made our first discoveries and uh, were reporting uh, things that we were seeing and sometimes i would like desperately for like 48 hours try to reach someone when we didn't have the the, the contact person yet um to like hang on here is like a group uh urging people not to vote and also by the way they are trying to some kind of um uh pyramid game uh, which looked like uh, some financial trick to to get money from people and uh so initially it was it was quite hard but once we established the relations it became easier because they they kind of trusted our our project to to flag relevant um things that we discovered so that's particularly for the um work that we did around the dutch elections i can give some concrete examples perhaps later um but whether on on your question like um is the enemy us and is it either foreign, foreign interference or is it the business model of the social media platforms? Um, I think it's not either or, but and, and, and. So if there's one thing that and foreign interference and domestic populism and tech platform business models have in common, I would say that's polarization. And as long as tech platforms have polarization as their business model, it can and will be abused by authoritarian adversaries to further polarize our societies, which means that our public debate, our shared reality, and therefore our democracy remain at risk until we change that business model. So I really strongly feel that democracy should disrupt polarization as a business model for tech platforms and as a vector for hybrid warfare. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And before I turn to you, Emily, I just want to make sure that everyone who is listening to this fascinating discussion uh, doesn't feel excluded by the fact that we're talking amongst ourselves. Um, if you have a question, uh, please put it into the chat function and uh, I will definitely take note of your questions and pass them to our excellent panel as we go along. Uh, Emily, I, I thought that Alice uh, raised a really good point um, ab about the fact that this is an and, and, and problem and not necessarily one of just disinformation or of a foreign interference. Uh, but of course, you know, we're, we're dealing with a, with a whole ecology here, a, a, an ecological system, if you like, where, where things move and change at the same time. And certainly some of the research that, that we've carried out in South Asia um, noted a really interesting phenomenon, and that is that the nature of politics is adapted to what social media platforms make possible. So just to give you an example, whereas in the past, political parties would come up with platforms by gathering the elders and deciding on the issues that they wanted to run on or 
in a more sophisticated way, sometimes running polling or focus groups among target populations in order to determine the issues that they want. Now, all of a sudden, they're using the internet as a kind of a focus group in the wild. So mm. someone who's not attributed with a political party will put out a message, sometimes completely absurd. And, and if that message happens to gather you know, or become sticky or organic, suddenly that becomes part of the political platform. So I guess the question here is, and I'm, I'm kind of getting at your, you know, your principal thesis and some of the work that you've done on manipulating media, you know, is part of the problem of, of regulation, the fact that we've now adapted to what these social media companies make possible. So the practice of politics has changed and, and disentangling regulation and politics has just become pretty well impossible. Uh, yes, I mean, I to say yes, yes, yes to all of what all three of you have said, um, I fully agree. And I just want to say, just to go back to Sophie for a second, um, thank you so much for saying what you said about the overemphasis on foreign interference and foreign inauthentic coordinated behavior, because, you know, our research at the Media Manipulation Casebook and, and at the Technology and Social Change team at Harvard reveals that exact fact that so much, and even in the 2016 election, which is the canonical example of foreign you know, disinformation and interference in the election, honestly, if you go back and look at it, so much of what was actually fomenting uh, a misunderstanding and a partisanship and a fervor to elect Donald Trump was actually by real human beings, real authentic people, not bots, not, not foreign agent agents, just people in in the U.S. who had reason to believe. Um, and so I just I agree with everything that you've said. And yes, I mean the idea that we and our politics have adapted to the internet. You know, it's not it's not surprising because politics. This is something that Andrew Breitbart, uh, right wing, you know, media maven, knew better than anyone and said all the time and used it to his advantage was the fact that. Politics is downstream of culture. Culture comes first. Um, whatever our norms are, whatever our beliefs and opinions, politics follows from that. And, and in another truism is that when we as people and citizens of democracies or people living in an um, autocratic regime, when we talk about politics in many ways, we're really discussing media about politics because that's how we experience politics. And the internet has, has exacerbated the problems inherent in those truths, which is that the internet has accelerated culture. It's accelerated the um, bifurcation of beliefs and the, the polarization of, of groups, um, which then creates these snowballed cultural norms. And then that results in politics. And I mean, if you go back and do a, an autopsy of the 2016 election and the support on the extreme right um, for Donald Trump and then Donald Trump's platform, for instance, that he then catered to those people. In many ways, you know, it wasn't that, as you said, that the, the scions of the party or even of his own campaign had come up with a platform and then presented it. The internet bubbled up a platform, bubbled up beliefs from the, from the corners of an anonymous um, image boards and or Twitter or Reddit or all of these spaces where people came together, they the culture of the space, the, the structure of the internet allowed them to come up with norms and belief systems. And then they became so popular that, that politicians saw that it would be expedient to adopt that. So why was immigration the number one issue in the 2016 election? because it was the wedge issue that was animating the internet. And why was it not the number one issue in 2020? Because the internet had moved on. Um, and now race was an issue and the economy and COVID. Um, and so, you know, they scrambled to change uh, their opinions. And so, you know, the answer is absolutely yes. The, the internet has changed how all of this functions and we are just beginning to understand it and, 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 and understand and we're just beginning to understand even the role that media companies play. You know, as a journalist, um, one of my one of the things I'm most passionate about is trying to figure out how we can make this better. And journalists often think we can make it better by revealing truths. But one of the truths we must reveal is that media is also 
vulnerable to these same systems. We see something trending on Twitter, we write a story about it. We see something going popular on Facebook, we write an article about it. And when we do that, we platform the idea even further. So all these systems are connected in a way that then has, you know, direct impacts on politics and then on people's lives. Yeah, well, I, I love I love the point that you made about supercharged culture preceding uh, politics. And, and I think that's a really great way of, of segueing us to the sort of third part of our, our discussion. And that, and that is really on, on uh, how to make democracy better or to paraphrase Melania um, Trump, another cultural icon, how do we be best in democracy? Um, you know, as we know, the only constant is, is, is change and democracy is a journey and, and not a destination. So how do we ensure that in this hyper-globalizing world where, where culture is now transforming um, belief systems and where gatekeepers are, are both subject to uh, as well as victim of um, the, the, the surging uh, cultural waves that, that seemingly uh, route around them. Um, how do we enhance democracy without undermining fundamental rights? What steps should we consider to ensure that our digital enablers don't become our digital enslavers, recognizing the fact that disentangling politics and culture is so difficult. So Alice, maybe I'd like to, 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 to let you kick off the, this, this final segment of our, our discussion. Sure. Well, since we already discussed social media, I would like to focus on technologies in a broader sense. And because I have a background in social studies of science, technology and society, I made technological threats to democracy, one of the key pillars of my foundation, uh, Defend Democracy's work. So I'm very concerned about the myriad of mostly unintended side effects of new and emerging technologies to our freedoms and fundamental rights. And the current COVID pandemic, with our lives becoming even more digitalized and with many governments trying to find easy technological fixes for complex social problems has only accelerated those worrying developments. So unlike some other organizations, Defend Democracy tries to have a 360 degrees view and a coherent approach that I, ran, I already mentioned it before, unites the fundamental rights approach of democracy with the national security approach of democracy. And that's why we don't limit our technological scope to single issues like increasing election security, protecting data privacy, holding online platforms to account or tackling disinformation. This means that our technology platform, uh, sorry, technology program aims to follow and shape relevant developments and debates in the domains of artificial intelligence, algorithms, big tech, big data, Internet of Things, uh, digital surveillance, quantum computing. We really try to keep our eyes open to any technological development that might threaten or strengthen democracies and open societies. And there are so many. So our broad approach of technology has its roots in science, technology and society studies. That's the study of how society politics and culture affect scientific research and technological innovation, and how these in turn affect society, politics and culture. Now the central premise of our technology approach is that for technology to strengthen and not weaken democracy, it needs to be co-designed. Now, what does that mean? Co-design or participatory design is an approach to design attempting to actively involve more stakeholders. For example, anthropologists, citizens and users in the design process to help ensure the result meets users' needs and is actually usable. So it's not a design style, but an approach which is focused on the processes and procedures of design. It is used in a variety of fields as a way of creating environments that are more responsive and appropriate to their users' cultural, emotional, spiritual and practical needs. Now, this approach can also be used for technologies to better respect our fundamental freedoms and rights. 
How? Well, by involving experts and practitioners of technology ethics, human rights, digital rights, data privacy, cybersecurity, digital surveillance, etc., as stakeholders in the design process. So that way you can design technologies that have privacy by design or more operational security by design. So having technology with these features by design is of course critical to those at risk in authoritarian states, but also in backsliding democracies and in our increasingly polar polarized societies. Think of journalists, judges, scientists, I mean, virologists, uh, human rights activists and democracy defenders. So rather than regulate products, perhaps lawmakers and firms should start on the design side. Mm. It's, it's a, so you raise an interesting question, and 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 I, I'll turn next to Sophie, um, because in part, you know, what I've come across is that, uh, as as once someone said, uh, any technology suffi uh, sufficiently advanced may as well be magic, and for a current generation of politicians who tend to be 40, 50, 60 year olds, this organic understanding of what technologies such as those that you're describing, whether those are smart city systems, IoT. AI or, or social media platforms is, is not organic. I mean, these, these are digital immigrants, not digital natives. And there's a natural sort of conservatism on one hand of not wanting to upend the apple cart in terms of the apparent economic benefits that are being built, but at the same time, kind of an unwillingness or an inability to understand that the magic that they're creating could actually be creating harms. Uh, I, I'm wondering, Sophie, just, just from your experience within a large technical uh, organization, you know, how self-aware was even that organization of this transformative social power that it has and, and responsibility that it had perhaps for design thinking, as Alice think, as says, in terms of taking deliberate steps uh, as to the kind of social impact or consequences that it can have? Hi, Rafa. Thank you very much. And so I think the thing to realize is that there's a self-selection bias at any organization. And what I mean by that is that if you think Facebook is evil, you are less likely to work for Facebook. Just as if you think that the mainstream media is fake news, you are not likely to work as a news reporter. And so people at Facebook, many of them were certainly aware of the impacts that Facebook were having, but they were I would, I would say they were much more optimistic than perhaps the wider world about those impacts. They were, for instance, many, for, for instance, many people were motivated by the idea of making the world close, making the world closer and more connected, and and and, and were optimistic of democracy's impacts on, uh, of of social media's impacts on democracy from, for instance, the the Arab Spring. And so, and so, because of that self-selection self -selection bias, uh, the, 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 there tends to be, in fact, a bit of a siege mentality within the social media companies. Because, of course, people ha people have positive opinions of their company and want to and to rationalize the negative news reporting. And and oftentimes they get the idea that that, that no matter what they do, they'll, they'll be criticized for it and become cynical and and responsive as a result. And so I don't think the social media companies are good at policing themselves in that respect as a result, because, I mean, of course, they are very motivated for their own benefit. I mean, this is how capitalism works. The, go the goal is to make money, not to save the world, just as we don't expect Philip Morris to pay for its customers when they get lung cancer. Mm. But speaking but speaking more about re regulation and and imp and impacts for instance for for, in for instance one I one idea that would probably be very controversial but, and i want to be clear that i did not work on polarization myself but because this is a but because this is a subject that has come up repeatedly and has been discussed in this panel would be requiring that that social media companies display news feeds that are chronological rather than ranked based on their own ranking systems because the virality is frankly a large factor of of, mm -hmm. of, of polarization because in a world with much more information than attention spans people are naturally motivated to make their content as attention getting as possible to draw that attention and 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 attention getting usually means 
often means exaggeration or wild claims. Mm. Mm. I love that idea. Sorry, Rafal, can I jump in for one second? This is Emily. I just wanted to say I love that idea so much. And maybe Rafal, uh, I know you work on violence, like the mobilization of violence. And I think that there's a really related point here, which is that, you know, Sophie is right that when you ever you look at the top ranked things on Facebook or Twitter, um, in particular Facebook, it's always the most extreme and partisan. And what we find also is that um, motivated actors on the internet realize that the more extreme they are, the more engagement they get. And one of the most extreme things that they can do is enact violence. And then mm -hmm. images of violence, calls to, for violence, and depictions of violence then itself gets a ton of interaction. Um, and so th these things are really interrelated in a, a very dangerous way. No, I, th I think you're absolutely right. And, and one thing that I would say is, you know, that, that, that if violence or if extreme views are the ones that gain the most attention, then the bottom feeder for more attention is invariably politics, which means you start creating a, a very in, you know, in, in circle, a cycle that, that just simply feeds upon itself. But Emily, I'm, I'm going to sort of leave the, the wrap up to a certain extent to, to you here. And, and again, to, to quote that cultural meme, Melania Trump, you know, can democracy be best uh, under these circumstances? You know, we, we've heard two views, I think now, one, one from, from Alice who said, let's think positively, design thinking can get us out of this if we start taking this as the core of how we want these technologies to be shaped rather than us being shaped by these technologies. And I think we've heard Sophie saying, well, there's a certain reality to the way that these platforms work and, and ultimately attention wins. And if attention is bad or good, it doesn't matter because that's what drives the economic model. So where, where do you sit on this in terms of you know, how it leads us uh, down the path of, of, of the future democracy that has to live in this environment? You know, I think that it is true that within our current system and within the capitalistic incentives of a private industry uh, or private companies, that that is not... Con, um, conducive to democracy because the way that these systems are incentivized to make money with ads, with um, just I, you know, page views, all of that will always trend toward the extreme, which will trend toward the dangerous, um, and will, um, you know, when when you have something like Facebook or Twitter or a social media company or Google that is so good at making something scale up globally, then what it also scales up is harm. Um, so we're seeing a crisis of harm and misinformation at scale. Um, but I but I also agree that, you know, we could design a different way uh, there. You if however, the genie is out of the bottle, like Sophie said. So there are companies that are trying to do it differently. There are companies that, in, you know, embrace open source uh, rules or that have communal uh, guidelines and people come together and rank things you know according not to what is exciting but to what is true and accurate um but what it's going to need is is a really concerted coming together of governments and civil society organizations and re and regular users of the internet perhaps to say you know uh the money money cannot be the uh the be all end all of the internet if the goal of the internet is to make a few people rich the internet is not going to be conducive to democracy so this is i think one of the really good arguments in favor of you know breaking up the internet monopolies if there was more competition between these systems if facebook and twitter weren't our only options if google wasn't so incredibly difficult to disentangle oneself from and there were legitimately actually good alternatives then people might be incentivized to pick the alternatives that are more ethical and that are more conducive to um, democracy and th that's the kind of thing that i think we can begin to break apart these big huge monopolistic systems who do frankly rival the power of governments um, and therefore are in some ways undemocratic on their face. But it really does, like the only way we're going to design a public interest internet that works for democracy is if we let go of the idea that money is the most important factor because, um, yeah. 
Emily, thank you very much. And, and really, thank you very much for all the panelists. This has been a, a fascinating discussion. Uh, although we may not have uh, solved the future of democracy in the digital era, I think we've certainly enlightened the audience with uh, some insights about uh, concerning some of the issues that will be shaping it in the future. And, and perhaps as a, as a way of ending this panel and thanking the three of you, Alice, Sophie, and, and Emily, um, I'll use yet another classical illusion, uh, illusion from, uh, from, from Greek mythology. Once Pandora's box was opened, maybe as such as our technological age and all the ills of the world were released, there was one thing left. And that one thing was hope. And on that, thank you very much. And uh, Kyle, handing over back to you. Thank Thanks, you. Uh, Rafael, for that uh, amazing job moderating. Alice, Sophie, and Emily, thank you so much for joining us, taking time out of your day. I'll ask you now if you could leave the studio, um, and we're going to ask invite on all our next panelists. So I'm going to hand over, introduce uh, the next uh, moderator of uh, the session on digital authoritarianism. It's Michael Petru. Uh, for those of you who don't know Michael, uh, he's the editor in chief of Open Canada. Uh, Open Canada is a uh, Canada's top platform on discussions on global affairs and international issues. Um, and actually had a piece written uh, for Open Canada on digital authoritarianism. So it's great we have Michael here. And Michael's also a fellow at MIGS and at the Wild Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. So with that being said, I'm going to uh, pass over to you, Michael. Thank you, Kyle. And thank you everybody for being here. Um, this is a, a topic that is close to my heart. Uh, I remember clearly the the Arab Spring of uh, 10 years ago and some of the other civil society and pro-democracy movements that I had covered as a reporter. And in 2011, it seemed for a moment that new technologies, that the new digital world and digital media was rocking and shaking the foundations of authoritarianism, authoritarianism everywhere uh, and empowering Democrats as well. It was very exciting. Uh, and it didn't last. I think now we're having to confront the uh, the other side of that sword, and that is the uh, the usefulness as a tool of uh, of repression and of crushing dissent and of other uh, tactics of authoritarianism that our new digital uh, age has uh, has made possible. Um, so I can't think of three uh, better people uh, to help guide us through. Uh, some of these issues. Um, Chris Meserol is the research director uh, in artificial intelligence and emerging technology initiative uh, at the in the foreign policy program at the Brookings Institution, uh, where he is also a fellow. Uh, Sophie Richardson is the China director at Human Rights Watch, and Margaret McQuaig Johnson is a senior fellow at the University of Ottawa's Institute for Science, Society, and Policy. Uh, I'm going to ask each of the speakers to deliver some opening remarks, uh, and then we have a, we'll have a guided discussion, which I'll I'll kick off, and I'm looking forward to uh, to input and questions from the audience as well. Uh, so, Chris, I'll ask you to start, please. Uh, thank you so much uh, to to Mix for hosting this and for uh, the great moderating. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my, uh, you know, I, I think I, I thought I'd start off by just kind of doing some level setting around what digital authoritarianism is, is and, and why authoritarian regimes are increasingly turning to technology uh, to solve many of the governance challenges that they in particular face. And I, I think to, um, you know, to help frame that conversation, uh, the starting point is just to kind of realize that uh, authoritarian regimes, like all regimes, including even democratic ones, their, their core interest is really in regime survival over time. Uh, which means that they need to have information about two things. Um, the first is just kind of information about what their population uh, is thinking, uh, what you know, what public opinion is, what popular opinion is, uh, which they can use to help them, you know, to help guide uh, their understanding of what the political costs of different policies will be, uh, and help ensure that they'll stay in power no matter what they uh, enact. The other, you know, piece of information that they need, um, that any regime needs, is an understanding of who the dissidents are within their society, um, and you know what, you know where they are located, who they are, um, and uh, what kind of threat they might pose to the regime over the long term. Um, historically, democracies and authoritarian regimes have taken very different approaches to, you know, how they resolve those challenges. Uh, democracies have the advantages of elections, which. Um, you know, they, you know, provide information about what the general public is thinking uh, on the one hand. Uh, they also provide legitimacy for the regime on the other so that there's fewer uh, dissidents in the first place. Um, the, 
for authoritarian regimes, they don't have that luxury. And so they've always historically uh, really struggled to, be, you know, to understand exactly what's going on uh, in their society, which, um, you know, we had, uh, uh, you know, at the outset, uh, the Arab Spring was mentioned. It's an example of, you know, the Mubarak regime in Egypt, for example, lost control and lost understanding of what uh, the Egyptian public was thinking. Um, you know, the same, something similar happened to the you know, Soviets uh, at the end of the Cold War. Um, and it's a real challenge for uh, most authoritarian regimes, especially in a pre-digital era, to be able to monitor and understand what, um, you know, what the political costs of different policies are. Um, and likewise, it's also very difficult or could be very difficult for them to understand um, you know, who dissidents and in particular kind of violent dissidents might be uh, within their societies. Um, but what's changed is that digital technology, and I think it's become very clear over the last decade that if um, uh, you know, authoritarian regimes harness digital technology and the kind of large data sets uh, and, and new sources of information and data that they provide, um, they can actually very effectively begin to understand both popular sentiment and public sentiment, um, and also really at a very granular level begin to understand um, both who might be, a th you know, understand who at an individual level might be a threat to the regime. Uh, and this is kind of, these are two capabilities that really have never existed before uh, in human society at scale, certainly not the scale of, you know, a regime that's, that's covering, you know, hundreds of millions, let alone, you know, over a billion people. Um, and so it's become uh, a really profound and powerful tool for authoritarians uh, who are interested in regime survival um, and you know are trying to identify you know how to maintain their their uh, regime security over the long run. Um, the challenge uh, for you know the, uh, unfortunately, I think one of the things that we've seen is that this model of kind of blending state power uh, over a large populace with you know really advanced, sophisticated AI and digital technologies. Um, it is unfortunately regrettably effective. And I think the probably the best, best example of that, or worst, I should say, example of that so far is what's happened in China, uh, and in particular in Western China in, in Xinjiang, where you have kind of traditional brute force tactics of, of many authoritarian regimes in the past, coupled with really advanced, sophisticated uh, data analytics um, and uh, things like facial recognition, uh, real-time processing of live video feeds where you can, you know, if you're authoritarian, you know, if, if you're, you know, law enforcement or police or domestic security service, you can begin to track people in real time as they go around, uh, you know, a city. Uh, these kinds of technologies have never really been uh, something that, you know, I think every authoritarian regime has, has dreamed about, but they've never actually really been possible before. Uh, and we're just now beginning to glimpse, you know, the kinds of human rights abuses that are possible at scale uh, when authoritarians have these kind of technologies at their disposal. Um, and, you know, that's kind of, I think, the core issue with digital authoritarianism. And, and for policymakers in Canada, the United States, and other democracies, I think the, it, the real question going forward is how do democracies, um, you know, given the capabilities that these new technologies provide, and that many of them are kind of dual use uh, capabilities, how do we, you know, effectively counter their use by authoritarian regimes in China or Russia you're increasingly elsewhere around the world, including the, you know, the Gulf in the Middle East or uh, in some sub-Saharan African countries or Latin America. Um, so it's, a, it's one of the most pressing challenges, in my view, for democracies going forward and hopefully one that uh, we can begin to, to flesh out here today. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. You've given us a lot to talk about, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, Sophie, please go ahead. Hi, thanks for inviting me to join you, and I'm going to put some sort of scary... Uh, meet on what, what Chris has just sketched out with respect to China. Uh, it was more than 10 years ago, uh, closer to 15, that uh, the 2010 Nobel Peace Prize winner, Liu Xiaobo, who passed away in 2017, referred to the internet as God's gift to the Chinese people. And unfortunately, uh, uh, things haven't turned out that way. Uh, it's important to underscore that the Chinese government is already extremely powerful. Uh, and few agencies more powerful domestically than the Public Security Bureau and its research agencies and arms, which in turn have close relationships with large Chinese tech firms. And particularly since uh, the advent of biometric chipped ID cards, we've been tracking the human rights consequences of the Chinese government's use of technology. And some people have likened this current situation to 
the old street committee system where an individual would be tasked by the local party secretary with keeping track of 10 families uh, and reporting back on them as sort of being that old street committee, that old street committee system radically enhanced by technology. So over the last seven or eight years, we have written about everything from the Chinese government's use of predictive policing, uh, putting together things like DNA databases, uh, the use of artificial intelligence, facial voice gate recognition software. Uh, you know, all of this takes place in a context in which there are no real enforceable privacy rights and increasingly no way to live outside the state's line of sight. If you have to use that ID card to buy bus tickets or enter public buildings or you know, enter a public compound, or indeed, as we saw in the early months of the pandemic, you know, use a smartphone that's linked to your national ID card to get your health code app that lets you get out and move around based on whether you've been exposed to COVID. You know, that gives the state an enormous amount of information about you you can't really, in any practical sense, resist the collection of that kind of data. Uh, and there are really no means available to people to contest uh, authorities doing this. And so an already powerful state becomes that much more powerful. We've particularly written about the uses and abuses of different technologies in the Uyghur region of China, Xinjiang, which is in the northwest of the country. It's the region uh, with uh, about half, a little less than half the population now uh, are, are Turkic Muslim communities. Uh, and in 2019, we came across in an open online source, uh, part of an app that we had had interviewees tell us about. Uh, it was called, it's called the Integrated Joint Operations Platform. And we decided to download it and reverse engineer it. We knew this was an app that had been designed for police officials in the region, but we wanted to know what the app was. What did it do? What sorts of information did it want? And what our research revealed was an app that essentially aggregates enormous amounts of data from all different sensory feeds, whether they're surveillance cameras, whether they're data doors, Wi-Fi sniffers, the QR codes outside people's homes, all of those are the technologies I just mentioned, and essentially aggregates them into one massive database. And there's an algorithm that decides whether your conduct has you flagged as suspicious. Now it's worth noting that of the roughly 36 different behavior types that we were able to see coded into this algorithm, the overwhelming majority of them were legal behaviors. They were things like whether you are putting gas in somebody else's car, whether you are talking to your neighbors more or less, whether you are going out the front door or the back door of your house. And so on the one hand, you find yourself thinking it's extraordinary that the state has the capacity to gather this data. It does, as Chris was just describing. Uh, but also that that we now know is used uh, in some cases to put people in forms of arbitrary detention. Uh, it's become a, a pretty serious uh, human rights crisis. We now refer to the situation in Xinjiang as one involving crimes against humanity. So I think it's very important to contemplate how states use this technology in environments where they can't vote a government out or try to change a law or even send a letter to a local paper complaining about the uses of these technology, let alone, you know, debate the merits of them with politicians or through the media. You know, those are all steps that people all across China take at great risk to themselves. Um, I'll also just throw out that uh, my wonderful colleague Maya Wong has written, I think, a very provocative piece recently making the point that the answer to digital authoritarianism can't be surveillance capitalism, meaning that what we really need to strive for globally are the highest and strongest possible privacy rights that protect users everywhere. Uh, so the answer to you know, a, a company like CETC, a major Chinese firm that helped, many, that helped design uh, the integrated joint operations platform are not Western tech companies that hoover up information uh, for profit. And that, that I think is where the rights community has some real inroads to try to make in strengthening the protections for users everywhere, regardless of whether they're in a democracy 
or in an authoritarian state. So maybe I'll stop there and pass off to Margaret. Wonderful, thank you, Sophie. Margaret, go ahead, please. Much. I'm really pleased to be here with my stellar colleagues. I'd like to talk about what China's digital authoritarianism means for us here in Canada. I've helped China to develop its science and technology capacity since my first visit there in 1979, but I've become increasingly concerned about the technologies they're developing and what they're doing in their international partnerships. And I've been very concerned to see that can Canadian universities have been partnering with Chinese surveillance technology companies that have been implicated in the repression of the Uyghurs. For example, SenseTime makes the facial recognition equipment that can differentiate Uyghurs from Han Chinese in a crowd. The artificial intelligence hub at the University of Alberta partners with SenseTime's Hong Kong AI Institute to en encourage new connections between innovators in Alberta and Hong Kong. The Hong Kong Institute now lists U of A's AI hub as a strategic partner, along with Alibaba, which provides the Zoom platform for Chinese students studying abroad that CSIS has warned Canadian universities about. Similarly, the Chinese company iFlyTech makes voice recognition equipment and has developed a voice pattern database. Uyghurs in Xinjiang have been forced to go to their local police station to have their voice recorded in different modulations so that the police know exactly who is speaking and about what on phone conversations. In Canada, iFlyTech has paid $1.5 million to establish a lab and a research chair at York University focused on neural computing for machine learning. The company has also given 727,000 in research funding to Queen's University for deep learning modeling that detects and processes speech. So students and profs working in these labs are helping that company. In addition, Xi Jinping's policy to integrate civilian and military technology development means that Canadian researchers partnering with colleagues in China in areas like artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, biotech, photonics, quantum computing, and advanced materials may not realize that their great ideas shared with Chinese colleagues may be going out the back door into military applications. Chinese civilian scientists cannot refuse to partner with military counterparts. The same professor at York, whose research chair is paid by iFlyTech, has co-published with four researchers at China's National University for Defense Technologies and one of those UNDT researchers was previously on staff at the lab at York. There are 160 such military universities and labs on a list compiled by the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, and Canada is number three in the top 10 countries collaborating with them. The federal and Alberta governments, to their great credit, have reviews of this issue in Canada underway, and I hope other provinces will join them. The Chinese company BGI does genomic sequencing and has loaned million dollar sequencers to multiple universities and at least one hospital across Canada. The day-to-day -day maintenance is by mainland Chinese nationals provided by the company. BGI manages China's largest genome database and it markets a, um, access to genomic data from its research projects around the world under the name Dr. Tong. In Canada, for example, BGI is what's called the receptor organization for RNA data in its ongoing $4.6 million project, funded in part by Genome Canada for the genomic profile of women with preg pregnancies at high risk of early labor at Mount Sinai Hospital. The project shares data with the company, but the, the data agreement can't be provided to the Canadian public under the confidential terms of the agreement. I'm sure that women who had their children at Mount Sinai would like to know if their RNA data is now in China. Similarly, the university's agreements with BGI for their COVID testing sequencers are also confidential according to the terms of the agreements. Lastly, you may be surprised to hear that China's social credit system has arrived in Canada. A global chain of Chinese hot pot restaurants called Hai Di Lao with uh, locations in uh, Vancouver and Toronto has more than 60 surveillance cameras in each restaurant with 
two for each of 30 tables. According to a manager, they're there to track the people eating there and to punish staff if they don't adhere to standards. The data and video is sent back to China, likely as the company's data contribution to China's new corporate social credit system. As our innovation minister, Francois-Philippe Champagne puts it so well, the China of 2021 is not the China of 2016. And I completely agree. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, Margaret. Um, Margaret, I think I'd like to kick off the, course, the discussion with some, some questions for you. I mean, you've given us, I think, a eye-opening and maybe a backfooting, I suppose, a, a, a disturbing insight into the extent of some of the surveillance um, and the extent of the collabor collaboration or cooperation with some Canadian institutions and uh, universities specifically. I'm wondering if you can give us a bit of an insight into what path those universities and institutions should be taking uh, going forward. What are their, their ethical obligations? What are their legal obligations? I mean, how do they... How do they navigate the extent of cooperation that they should be having with these Chinese firms or not? And what factors should go into that decision? Yeah, th that's a really important question. And that's really what the federal uh, government and the Alberta government are grappling with right now. And I think other provinces are waiting, to, are watching to see what, what's happening. Um, universities for the last couple of years when these issues have been raised have said that the federal government has not given them instructions to stop doing this. But it seems to me that they are abdicating um, an ethical responsibility, and that is to put an ethical lens on what they're doing. Corporations, and you know, they have their own issues on some of these questions, but corporations uh, are very engaged in communities on corporate social responsibility. Universities need to, to put an ethical lens on their decisions. And I've raised these issues with, uh, with um, presidents of universities, with uh, scientists, with research hub directors. And, you know, they acknowledge the issues, um, but then they uh, take a step back and say, well, nobody's telling us not to do it. And, you know, they're getting funding. This is a big deal uh, in terms of the amount of money that China is uh, bringing into Canada for this research funding where they're getting our best minds. We need to be funding our own research at higher levels. And uh, the other thing is, uh, I think we need to also recognize that organizations such as the Canada Pension uh, Plan, um, uh, CPPIB Investment Board, um, should also be putting an ethical lens on these issues. Because, uh, you know, they take a step back and, and say, well, you know, we'll lose 2% for our uh, pension pensioners if we stop investing in Alibaba. And that's not the right question. I think the question is, are these ethical companies? And if not, divest and look for ethical companies. It's not that hard to, to figure this out. Okay. Couple of questions. I mean, first of all, you mentioned the money in the case of the pension plan. Is that the motivating factor for universities as well, or, or what do they get out of these collaborations? Yeah, they're getting hundreds of millions of dollars from from them, and frankly, we don't know the full extent because they're not honest and upfront about it. Um, a journalist tried to do a a, a story on. Uh, all of the universities in Canada and the amount that they're getting from China about a year ago. And the first couple of universities he approached wouldn't talk to him about it. They said, oh, that's all confidential. And recent media reports have shown that some of the uh, investments or that um, uh, are, have been made in universities and donors to universities have been uh, concealed. It's, it's a... a a topical issue now, isn't it? You know, what, the extent to which Canada is collaborating with China because public opinion has really turned against China in uh, the last, uh, in the last uh, few years because of the kidnapping of our Canadians. And so uh, the, the uh, uh, I think universities need to start to pay more attention to the ethical lens that they're using. Okay. Let me just 
maybe push back a little bit. And I mean, is it not a fair position for a university president to take to say, look, like, my job isn't national security. That's CSIS's job. And unless CSIS or the Canadian government tells me that this is a threat to Canadian Canada security or other, other ethical concerns, that's not really up to me to decide. I mean, this is this is a federal responsibility, and I'll take my lead from them. Is that is that a valid is that a valid argument? Uh, if not, no, I, no, I don't think so. I mean, they're, they're grown people. They can take a look at what this this uh, these companies are doing in China, and do it at their own assessment uh, at the the level of the senator board of the university, if necessary and say, you know, these are organizations that we simply don't want to be part of. Uh, the other uh, challenge here is that um, we have a split responsibility jurisdictionally. So the federal government provides funding to university research, so do the provinces, and education is provincial jurisdiction. So it's a split jurisdiction at issue as well. Uh, so there's a certain amount that the CSIS can do in advising and better informing universities. And, uh, and there's a lot that I think um, that can be done by the universities themselves. And we'll see what these uh, two reviews come up with. The federal one is um, uh, at the end of June and the other will take another couple of months after that. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll let you off the hot seat in a second, Margaret, but I, I, Sophie, I believe, has a question for you, which uh, I'll, I'll pass the mic over to her. Okay, great. Now, Margaret has actually already largely answered it, but maybe I can just chime in a little bit on this issue, you know, which is to say that, uh, you know, I'd be willing to bet that most Canadian universities would avoid taking money from, say, Halliburton or you know, other international firms that have problematic reputations. And I think some of them have taken money from Chinese tech companies because they didn't really know who they were and they didn't do their homework, which is remarkable for universities. Uh, and they didn't wanna do their homework. And we've heard from schools that will say, well, you know, we need the money. We have no other way to do this research. Sometimes that's true, and I think there's therefore also a role for governments to, you know, make sure that there are, as, as Margaret says, ample resources to do research on their own. You know, but these are people who should be exercising good judgment, and you know, I think especially public institutions have an obligation to make public uh, information about all of the entities from which they are receiving funds. You know, and we all know that just because something is is not specifically prohibited by law doesn't necessarily mean that doing it is such a great idea. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. I have a, a question from Twitter that I'd like to put to Chris. That it touches on something that I was hoping to probe uh, you on uh, as well, Chris. Um, you've written about the export of digital authoritarianism. Uh, I would recommend members of the audience check out uh, his article, which is on the Brookings. Uh, web page. Um, the question is, uh, what can be done to prevent the exportation of US technology uh, to authoritarian uh, regimes? And if I could maybe piggyback on that, um, some of those authoritarian regimes, China, Russia, are in turn exporting their technology. And I wonder if you can speak a little bit about how that is kind of reshaping power balances and, and relationships uh, internationally, so kind of a bit of a, a, a two-pronged and large question, but I'd, I'd I'd love to hear your hear your insight on on it, please. Yeah, th thanks so much. It's a, those are great questions, and I think they're. Um, uh, I'm glad that they were framed the way they are because there's really two different issues. There's one is you know how how should we regulate and govern you know American or kind of uh, democratic technologies as they're being sold to China, and then there's the the separate but very related question of you know how um, how should we think about uh, countering the sale of Chinese technology abroad? Um, and on the on the sale of U.S. technology or uh, democratic technology, um, the, there I'll start with the good news, which is that there you know that we do have pretty strict export control laws for certain kinds of technologies. Um, most of those technologies historically have been um, you know export controls have been limited to things that have very you know what might be thought of as single use military applications or high risk applications. Um, uh, what's unique about AI and a lot of these digital technologies is that they're actually dual-use technologies that have perfectly valid um, uh, 
you know, civilian uh, purposes. So, you know, something like facial recognition, you know, I, I think probably many people watching this probably have had the experience of using uh, a photos app on their phone uh, that can kind of recognize their son or their daughter um, or their friend uh, in a photo and it makes it easier to, you know, to organize the photos. And like, you know, I think that that's, you know, a, an acceptable use of the technology. The challenge is when that technology gets coupled with state power and, and how to um, regulate that given that some of the best kinds of AI are coming out of uh, the United States uh, and some of our closest allies. Um, the challenge uh, that I would say going forward, and, and I think you'll start to see more and more of this, one of the you know, challenges of regulating the, uh, you know, exports of digital technology is that a lot of the technologies are readily substitutable. Um, and so for something like AI, um, there are kind of off the shelf replacements for a lot of the pieces of the AI stack, uh, in particular, the algorithms. So, you know, AI is kind of made up of data and algorithms uh, and computing power. And, uh, you know, it's about, it's fairly simple, simplistic, but that's kind of the core of it. Um, the, AI, you know, the, algo the algorithms tend to be open source. They tend to be kind of, everybody's kind of broadly aware of what the most cutting edge algorithms look like for things like computer vision or for natural language processing. Um, uh, what's, you know, unique in many cases is both the data, um, which the US can't really do much about the data that the China has internally, um, but they can do something about the computing power. And, and the, the reason is that um, the US, uh, Netherlands, uh, Japan, we kind of control or we, we were able to produce um, not necessarily the processors that are used by AI chips, but the equipment that is used to manufacture those processors. Um, and so I think one of the things you'll start to see going forward um, is that, you know, regardless of whether we stop selling processors to China, they'll, they'll be able to kind of, um, you know, potentially find other processors. What they can't find um, are the, you know, the, uh, what are called, you know, advanced photolithography machines or the equipment that um, uh, embed circuits uh, kind of at, at, you know, two or three nanometers onto a chip. Uh, and so I think you'll start to see more and more targeted sanctions that will make it much more difficult if you're a company like SenseTime uh, in China, whose mission, you know, SenseTime a couple of years ago came out and said that one of their goals is to have um, a video capability uh, where they could process 100,000 video streams in real time and identify uh, a particular individual across all those streams. Um, that's a really computationally expensive task that's really hard to do. Uh, if China did not have access to, or, or the ability to produce cutting edge, um, uh, processors, uh, it would be significantly more expensive for them to be able to do that to, to the point where it might not actually be feasible for them to do that. Um, so I think you'll start to see much more targeted sanctions uh, for that kind of technology that's not readily substitutable or that China can't kind of um, create on their own. Uh, as for the, the question of you know what to do about Chinese technology that's being exported out of China around the world and what impact that's having, one of the most interesting, I think, questions for people watching China is, you know, as they engage the rest of the world, are they kind of engaged more by a profit motive and they're just trying to sell their technology to anyone who will buy it? Are they kind of dominated by ideology, you know, where they're really just trying to support uh, like-minded countries around the world? Or, you know, are they really taking a strategic view to who and where they're selling their technology? Um, and there's been a fair amount of research, or some research done on this, including by my colleague, uh, uh, Sheena Greitens, um, who has done some really great work on, um, uh, uh, you know, looking at where China has exported its uh, uh, capabilities uh, around the world. And one of the things that she's found is that it's, they tend to do this with a very, very much with a strategic lens in mind. Uh, so they're not just, you know, exporting to other, um, you know, communist countries around the world or kind of countries that are, you know, in line with China's ideology. Uh, they're also not just kind of selling to, you know, nilly, willy nilly to the highest bidder all the time. Uh, they really are being somewhat strategic in how they're approaching and partnering with uh, countries around the world. Um, in particular, you know, areas of strategic value to China, um, uh, you know, both in uh, East and Central Asia, but also uh, increasingly uh, in Latin America and in Sub-Saharan Africa as well. Um, and, you know, they, they've kind of pioneered a model that's fairly successful um, and that, you know, democratic countries to date haven't really done a great job of countering, which is to say when, when China kind of begins to export its digital authoritarian and the, the, the tech stack behind that digital authoritarianism, they have a very simple, straightforward story and a very turnkey solution. So they can go to um, either a ruling regime or a local kind of urban government and say, you know, if you use our technology, you'll be able to track everybody uh, within your jurisdiction. 
um, we'll provide some training for you. Um, you know, we will kind of make it as simple and easy for you to use as possible. And we will also you know, sell it to you very cheaply, uh, much more cheap, much more cheaply than uh, you know other uh, competitors might be able to do. Um, and in part, they're doing that because of they, you know, they're willing to subsidize it. Um, by contrast, you know, Western countries and uh, in particular liberal democracies don't really have uh, you know turnkey solutions uh, that we're offering to um, you know countries around the world who are looking to build out their own uh, you know telecommunications infrastructure. Um, or security infrastructure. And so uh, I think there's a real pressing need to begin to counteract exactly how it is that, that China is both developing uh, these technologies internally, but increasingly you know, how they're exporting them around the world. Because I think if, if you are concerned about human rights and, and liberal values, I would say the, the export of these technologies that, that China has pioneered domestically is probably the greatest threat um, you know, over the coming generation um, to human, you know, human rights and human freedom uh, going forward. Yeah, thank you. Um, that sort of export and the resulting impact has a cultural element to it as well. Um, I think, so if I'm wondering if I can ask you about some of the efforts by China specifically to uh, rewrite some of these accepted international norms uh, in the process of exporting and trying to spread some of these, uh, some of these technologies and the accompanying uh, authoritarian tactics that, uh, that they facilitate. Yeah, thanks. I think it's not so much a question of culture as of power. Uh, uh, there's something inherent to Chinese culture that, that, that suggests authoritarianism is the right path. But you know, what we see on a number of different issues, uh, particularly in a venue, for example, like the United Nations Human Rights Council or throughout the, the UN's human rights ecosystem is an effort by the Chinese government and the party to start revising norms uh, in ways that are uh, helpful to the Chinese government. In, and by this, I mean things like trying to uh, weaken the idea of that system as a means of holding states accountable or uh, you know, reinforcing the idea or trying to place the idea of state sovereignty as, as logically prior or more important to things like accountability or upholding international human rights law, even when binding treaties have been agreed. And we see this play out around digital issues, particularly in the Chinese government's efforts to sort of sell the idea of internet sovereignty, meaning that it's up to each individual. Uh, it means government uh, within the UN system, they'd stay, they'd stay state. But that it's up to each individual government to decide, you know, what degree of internet freedom a given population should have, and that there shouldn't be international standards. Uh, you know, the the then that's an idea that's very popular with other authoritarian regimes who are very happy to get behind Chinese government proposals, and you know, partly because most uh, democratic countries can't or won't uh, devote the same level of resources to being represented at all of the, the, the million and one Byzantine openings in the UN system as the Chinese government can. You know, Beijing has made some serious inroads around issues like internet governance uh, you know, that at some point in the future will be put forward as binding standards and democracies will have to scramble to push back against them. Yeah, but it's a it's a pathology that really ranges not just you know really from internet sovereignty to a host of other different issues like you know whether governments should be held accountable for crimes against humanity, whether independent civil society should have a role to play at all in the UN system, uh, whether treaties should be binding, what constitutes human rights. I mean, there's some there's some significant debates, and, and China has advanced its position considerably in the last decade, and we think that requires fairly urgent response. Okay. That, uh, I mean, that allows me to bring in a, another question from, from, from Twitter about the form that response should take and, and where it should happen. Uh, and, I mean, I'll ask this to you, Sophie, but I'll also please uh, throw it up to Chris and Margaret. Um, I mean, what is the, the role of the United Nations as a, as a forum for this sort of, uh, I suppose, confrontation or this sort of work to take place? Uh, does the United Nations have a role in this, uh, in this process? And if so, what is it? Well, you know, this is the premier international venue for setting international human rights standards and upholding them. 
Um, you know, is it the institution of my dreams? No. Is it better than many of the alternatives? Yes. You know, it's, it's, it's what we've got. Uh, you know, and the challenges on these particular issues around digital authoritarianism or, or digital governance really do range from, you know, what international standards ought to look like and, and you know, whose views are even heard in that debate all the way through to you know, the Chinese government putting forward problematic Chinese tech companies as partners in UN initiatives. Uh, even you know when that involves giving uh, those companies access to data of people all around the world, that even really being clear that that data can be collected. The UN 75 uh, anniversary uh, festivities, so to speak, uh, one part of them were almost hosted by a global uh, effort that would have been run by Tencent, which is notorious for censorship and data gathering. Uh, until at the last minute, the people responsible within the UN system uh, uh, thought better of going that route and dropped that part of the program. But you know, Beijing is constantly poking and probing different opportunities within the system you know, to inject companies, technology, or principles. Thank you. Uh, Chris or Margaret, do you want to weigh in on that? Uh, uh, I can just come in briefly on the uh, another area that's I think really important is the UN ITU, which is where um, a lot of you know part of the, what the UN does is kind of set you know human rights standards, but there's also some technical standards that they'll set. Um, and so one of the things that's been distressing I think to those of us in the technical community um, who've been studying policy for things like facial recognition um, is that I think uh, there's been a sense of complacency among a lot of democracies that the ITU historically has settled on standards that. Um, most democracies are, are comfortable with um, and have developed and proposed on their own. Um, China, I think, has kind of noted um, all the advantages that have accrued both, you know, economically and politically and geostrategic, you know, geopolitically um, from standard setting uh, that, you know, the U.S. And, and other democracies have had over the last 50 years. And they've really invested pretty heavily in trying to get their own sta standards um, uh, approved at the ITU. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that, you know, going forward, the, one of the roles that the UN can play um, and is around things like facial recognition um, where, you know, I don't really, we've already, I think Margaret already mentioned the fact that China has developed facial recognition classifiers that will explicitly racially profile people or ethnically profile people. Um, and that's the entire point of the algorithm. That would be kind of, um, you know, I think most you know, democracies would, would find that, uh, you know, horrific at best. Um, and yet, you know, the country that's producing that kind of algorithm uh, is now kind of, to some extent, setting the agenda for what the UN uh, standard will be um, uh, for things like for facial recognition technology. And so I think there's a, a significant role to play for discrete technologies like that uh, through the ITU, uh, you know, in addition to, you know, obviously all the great work that the UN does on human rights as well. Okay, thank you. I have another question from Twitter. Uh, President Biden is working to get the, U the EU to work with the United States to counter China's tech challenge. How important is this and what is Canada's role? Margaret, do you want to take that? Yeah, in fact, uh, just in the last day, there was a, um, an announcement of a Canada-EU collaboration of, of this sort. And we're seeing that Canada is, is becoming much more engaged uh, than it was under the Trump regime. Now that Biden is is uh, in charge in Washington, and uh, so I think we'll see a lot uh, with uh, the EU and with other allies. Uh, we have the D10 that got the very first step in creating such a, an organization. Happened at the G7 meeting this past week weekend, and um, this will take some time. But it's designed to address technology challenges that China is putting up. We also have the Quad, which has a technology working group. So that's, uh, I think, another important element. And for Canada, I just want to give a shout out to our UN ambassador, Bob Ray. He's been really taking these questions on uh, head on. Uh, he made a very strong representation on the uh, at the assembly um, in the face of uh, the Chinese ambassador uh, calling out comp other countries on what their atrocities in the past have been. And, you know, he was saying, you know, where in Xinjiang is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? 
And so, you know, the, I think it, it really matters that we have strong diplomats in these contexts and that they're, they're working the back rooms uh, as effectively as they're speaking out um, on the standards organizations. Uh, she himself instructed his uh, officials to move into the senior ranks of standards or organizations back in 2014. This was something that he saw as important so that Chinese standards in technologies um, are, are um, uh, considered to be the norm. And so we're, we've gotten the allies, I think, just starting to wake up to this in the last year or two. And so again, there we'll see more collective um, action, I think, you know, some concern that China now is at the, the top level or next to the top in a, as many as a dozen of these standard setting organizations. Okay, thank you. I have a, another Twitter question. Um, Sophie, and I'm, I'm, I admit I'm, I'm quite curious myself. I wonder if you, to the extent that you can, uh, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the challenges of uh, conducting research in uh, China specifically on these issues. I mean, how open are people talking to talking to NGOs? How else are you able to gather information? What are some of the, the challenges that Human Rights Watch faces? It's a, it's a great uh, question. It's one we deal with every day. It's gotten exponentially harder to do good research that involves trying to talk to people face to face when you are operating in an environment where there are surveillance cameras everywhere. Uh, and we would be a pretty lousy human rights organization if we put our, uh, our, you know, our sources at risk. So we now have to go through considerably uh, uh, greater and more complicated steps you know, to do research and to protect sources. And one of the attractions about writing, of writing about surveillance technology is that the technology itself is fairly easy to see. Uh, it's also brought us new and different sources of information. As I mentioned earlier, you know, a part of this app that had been designed, you know, for a highly repressive purpose was sitting out there open online waiting to be downloaded, as is a lot of other information. I think the Chinese government is catching on that, that leaving things like procurement documents or tenders uh, or various databases sitting open is not such a great idea because that's really formed the basis of a certain amount of reporting over the last couple of years by HRW and by others. Uh, you know, but but I'm not going to lie to you, it's that much more of a challenge than it was a decade ago. And we have to be very careful about how we, how we talk to people and tell their stories. Um, you know, I think Xi's long-term goal really is to try to create a dissent-free society precisely because people know that all of their behavior is watchable. Uh, and it's a very effective tool for preempting people from speaking out. Thank you. I want, to, uh, I want to ask all three of you about Huawei and other companies, Tencent, if, uh, Flytech. You talked about this a little bit. A little bit. Um, often the debate about Huawei specifically is concerning Canadian security and the uh, alleged or potential threat that Huawei might pose to Canada. Um, we do have a question uh, from Twitter framing it slightly differently or from a slightly different angle saying, um, should Chinese companies involved in using technology against minorities, like Huawei, Tencent, uh, be allowed to sell their products in Western countries? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Any, any of the three of you, please, please jump in. Yeah, or do we have? I mean, are, is there kind of an, beyond security? Are there are there ethical questions that should be uh, weighing in on Canadian officials if, if and when they ever get around to say, you know, decide in on uh, on Huawei's uh, Huawei's penetration into Canada, for example? Well, if I could, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, if I could jump in, I've I've written a lot on on Huawei, and uh, there are you know eighteen hundred and forty three reasons why we don't have want to have Huawei in our five G. Um, it's not like consumers can just go out and buy it, except for their phones. You can you can buy those, but uh, you know it's governments that buy these uh, systems or per permit them, and carriers that that use them. Um, but we've seen enough internationally in terms of the problems that Huawei brings, um, in terms of uh, of spying and uh, and you know uh, 
uh, having their their equipment embedded in the walls of of, uh, of government buildings, and so we've seen enough that this should not be an issue. And we've seen actually um, the ministers of the Canadian government saying, while they have not yet made uh, an announcement of a decision, national security will be their top priority. And you really can't have national security when you've got systems installed that require back doors to do uh, daily or weekly fixes, updates, and so on. That's the back door you hear about. Then there are also concerns about bug doors. In other words, a bug that's put in to be released at another time. So there are, there are many problems and, uh, and you know, I think we, we, I'd be tremendously just surprised to see Huawei in any of our systems uh, two years from now. Okay, thank you. Another Twitter question it says, lots of talk is on China, but what other countries should be on our watch list? Uh, maybe Chris, I'll throw that to you, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a number of, of other countries. Um, Russia is one that obviously comes to mind just because they um, are not shy about selling uh, technologies uh, abroad before they're necessarily mature or ready to be sold abroad, um, both in terms of their uh, uh, the, the quality and capability of those technologies um, and in terms of the, the governance structures that might, might be put in place around them. Um, another, you know, a, a region of the world that I, I increasingly worry about is also what's happening in the, in the Gulf um, and the Middle East. Uh, um, basically, the anywhere where you have uh, regimes that are authoritarian or liberal regimes that have a fair amount of state capacity and state resources, um, they can, you know, fairly readily kind of contract with China or with others to develop uh, really robust police states. And so, you know, um, in Dubai, I think they launched their, um, you know, police without policemen campaign uh, recently. And, you know, according to them, it's been remarkably effective. It's it's hard to verify, you know, exactly, you know, when they talk about crime levels being, you know, reduced uh, almost to zero. Um, it, it's, it's one, on the one hand, there's a real verification challenge. On the other hand, it's not necessarily, I mean, it, it could very much be credible if you have kind of um, the kind of te technology that they would have access to. Um, and you're kind of making the population aware uh, that you have access to that technology. To, to Sophie's point earlier, you know, populations will stop doing certain kinds of behaviors if they know that every time they do it, they're going to be seen and watched. Um, and it's a very effective, you know, uh, it's a very effective uh, means of control for authoritarian regimes, like like you see in, in some of the Gulf countries. Um, to you know, if you can get inside the the head of the the population that you're presiding over. Uh, to the point where they kind of just intuitively trust or believe that you're able to perceive everything they're doing and potentially even reading and, and seeing online. Um, you get a compliant society, but it's also one that I, I think is, you know, again, if you believe in human rights and, and liberal values, it's, it's kind of the dystopic nightmare version of what some of these technologies can do. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a, I'd like to pass to a broad, a broad question that, that I'd welcome insight from all three of you. Um, questions for Twitter. How serious are Western democracies in confronting this challenge? Are we being proactive or just reactive? What do you think? Well, I'll jump in on that one. Um, you know, we certainly think, as I said earlier, that, you know, we want to see democracies take the lead and, you know, do things like, you know, seriously consider bans on facial recognition software, which we slowly started to see individual jurisdictions in some countries do, um, you know, and, and pursue very strong uh, regimes of privacy rights. Uh, you know, but in a way, I, you know, I would answer some of the previous questions, not so much about countries per se, as, you know, whether the necessary rights protections are in place to make sure that you know, that, that citizens and human beings, individuals, voters are setting the standards around privacy rights rather than companies, you know, imposing them uh, and then leaving it to citizens to fight out whether that's appropriate or not. Uh, and I think a lot of, you know, the success of governments in Canada and the US and the EU will depend not just on finding ways to reject companies that are deeply implicated in human rights violations, because who wants to support that, uh, but also in 
you know, imposing pretty strict standards on the companies that are based in those countries as well. That's, uh, you know, that's, I think, I think we have to see both sides of that equation before giving anybody a prize for seriousness. Thank you. I would just add um, that I think we, we need to, to ensure that our governments are looking very realistically at China and what it's doing and what it could become over 20 years. And they're, they're certainly having these conversations about how to confront what they're seeing from China today. But they need to have a longer vision as to where this is going. And we've talked a little bit about the social credit system and the control over, um, over all Chinese citizens, as well as citizens abroad through their WeChat uh, conversations and watching for key words and punishing people who don't uh, pay their bills and, and take their garbage out on time and so on. And I wrote an op-ed back in January saying that China appears to be an emerging totalitarian government, not just authoritarian. And, you know, a totalitarian government has a one-party system, the CCP. It has um, no tolerance for dissent. And we've seen all the people thrown into detention for um, little or no reason at all uh, for, for what they've said about the state or uh, Xi Jinping as Winnie the Pooh. Um, and uh, and th they, they uh, have control over their citizens' lives, which is certainly what the social credit system is, all these surveillance companies, and the government has said that they're going to tighten those systems over time. So I think we really need to be um, looking realistically at China as not just authoritarian, but potentially totalitarian. And when, when I called it an emerging totalitarian government, the only pushback I got was that someone who said, what do you mean emerging? They're already totalitarian. So, you know, you just look at their behaviors and you look at the tools that they're using and how they're using them and you really can't come away with any other conclusion. And that makes it very serious for our governments to be confronting them. Thank you. Chris, do you want to, Sophie, anyone else want to add to Margaret's comments there? I would, the one thing I would add would be, um, I think one of the, as far as kind of a democracies relying on this issue, you know, I think one of the real challenges right now is that there are some democracies that view uh, China as a threat to human rights uh, only, and then there's others that view um, uh, China as a threat both in terms of human rights, but then also strategically, which I think is probably the position of, um, you know, the Biden administration. And so I think there's, you know, a fair amount of alignment that's starting to happen, but I, I don't know that uh, because they view the issue somewhat differently or they perceive the threat that China poses uh, in the long run to, to Margaret's point somewhat differently at the moment, I don't know exactly how much momentum will, will actually come out of uh, some of these initial um, uh, kind of coalitions or alliances around uh, technology development by China. Um, I, I think my hope is that just even the human rights concerns alone are enough to, to you know, you know, produce effective action by, um, you know, leading democracies around the world. But I think that still, to some extent, uh, remains to be seen. Thank you, Chris. And uh, thank you very much, Sophie and Margaret as well. Um, that was, I think, enlightening for uh, for everybody listening. It certainly was for me. And uh, I'm grateful to have had your, your insight. Um, I'm going to pass the mic back to uh, Kyle to wrap up this session. Thank you both. Thank you all. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Chris and Sophie. Uh, we really enjoyed having you on and sharing your expertise and your knowledge and uh, raising this issue in Canada and internationally. I think it's something we have to work uh, more on collectively as, uh, as think tanks and the non-for-profit sector and, and, and Canadians and international people around the world. So I'd like to, this is the end of day one for Wright City. Uh, we're going to resume tomorrow from noon to two Eastern Standard Time with uh, two sessions, one on the case for a digital Geneva Convention, so looking at how emerging technologies are used in, in the cyberspace to attack a civilian infrastructure and civilians. And we're also going to have a, a, the second session is on digital attacks on human rights and democracy activists. So uh, thank you for joining us today. We're gonna post these videos online soon and please do join us tomorrow. <laughs>